So Amy Stout is the electrical engineering and computer science librarian at, at MIT. She's a liaison to the EECS community, and she collects books and journals for their collection. She answers reference questions in the area and advocates for open access with her community. She works extensively on managing research data and responding to the needs of scientists involved in computational research. Prior to coming to MIT, Amy was the Digital Systems and Services Coordinator at the MBL Huey Library at Woods Hole. Amy received her MLIS degree from the University of Texas at Austin and her undergraduate degree from St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So hello, um, I'm Amy and uh, you know, that was exactly who I am as described. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, so I went to the ARL DLF EE Science Institute uh, as part of uh, a team from MIT. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of, on a so I think this was a great introduction because it's a very sort of high level theoretical why this all matters. So I wanted, what I wanted to give uh, you today was sort of a very practical sort of example of how what I learned at the Institute could be applied sort of on an everyday, in an everyday way to my institution. We haven't actually applied this, but maybe we will. But it's sort of theoretical, but you'll see. So I hope that it's uh, helpful in the sense that it gives a, sort of a practical vision of sort of the big picture ideas. So that's my goal, anyway. So, uh, so anyway, the, the MIT eScience team was, was me and uh, Steve Gass, some of you may know Steve, and also Jeff Schiller, who is, uh, uh, I guess his, his title is MIT Network Manager, but he is, he's amazing. He's been at MIT for 25 years managing every kind of IT thing imaginable. So part of the, the benefit to me of the eScience Institute was actually getting to know Jeff really well and uh, seeing uh, a really sort of broad IT perspective on everything we're trying to do with eScience in the libraries. So these are the activities in a somewhat different order from <laughs> the way Carolyn presented them, but they're essentially the same thing that we did at the eScience Institute. So I won't go over those again. So I think the, the real thing that I got out of the eScience Institute was that we are, one of our challenges is that we're trying to build services in a very rapidly changing environment. We really don't know where things are going. Um, I don't even think, you know, science as a whole knows quite where things are going. And so it's hard to build services that are, you know, sort of, I don't know, like if we did all the research, right, to build a very important service in like two years, everything will have changed. So, I, I read this article recently that was sent to me by Jen Walton from Woods Hole, and she's somewhere around here. And, uh, and it's Think Like a Startup, a white paper to inspire library entrepreneurialism. And it is available for free, you know, at brianmatthews.com. He is a librarian at Virginia Tech. And I really like this article because it talks about sort of having a very sort of entrepreneurial attitude towards establishing and developing library services. And I, when I read it, I thought, yeah, that's actually an approach that would work really well for, uh, for e-science. At least, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but at least at MIT, I think it would work really well. Um, so, and, so the thing that I really, uh, so one of the things, I guess I should say, the very practical thing that I got out of the e-science institute was that we really need to spend some time finding out exactly what researchers want and need. And I think we, I mean, we all have an idea, right? We sort of, maybe we hear an anecdote or we get some data and then we sort of extrapolate as to what the, what the, the the, the, the challenges are, but I think the more time we spend talking to researchers, we'll get an even better picture of what they need and want, and then we'll know what the real problems are that we want to solve. And so I think, and I, I think it, the key is for figuring out what researchers want and need, we need to balance the needs of the researchers with the, you know, in traditional library sense, the needs of the material, right? So it's like, it's important to get people books that they want and need, right? But it's also important that we not allow them to tear pages out of the books and put coffee you know, all over the books and, and that sort of thing. So we need to protect the material so that other researchers can use them. And that, those principles still stand for research data, right? So it's like we want to help the researcher with his or her data, but we also want to help future researchers use that data you know, so that it's curated in a way that it's useful and that sort of thing. All right, so what I have is a what I'm calling a theoretical case study, which is to say it's it's, it's, it's not a real case study, it's, it's based on uh, observed problems, things that I've observed, and sort of suggesting ways that librarians could use skills they already have to address these problems. So, uh, and so this is based on 
uh, one, a couple conversations. The first conversation was a conversation I had with a genomics researcher who works at Harvard. I was actually at a social gathering, but when I found out what her job was, I asked her if I could, you know, ask her a couple work questions. And, uh, and so I asked her sort of if she could characterize what challenges she faced with respect to research data. And again, this is just genomics, so, you know, this is very sort of genomic specific, but... Um, so she said that her lab had a strict cap on the amount of data she could store on the lab servers at any one time, and that she said this was infuriating because she ended up spending a lot of time going through data sets and deleting data that she didn't think she would need in order to comply with the limitations imposed by the lab. So anyway, she was spending less time, you know, that she wanted researching and more time sort of just deleting and doing this sort of like, you know, every time we, I don't know about you, but like I'll go through my email sometimes and it's like, oh my God, it takes all day, you know, to clean out the old email, and it's that sort of mind-numbing process that she's going through. She didn't like it. So then I also know a genomics lab manager at MIT, and this year he told me that he, uh, earlier this year he told me that he had started imposing a hefty fine on researchers who used too much data storage space in order to curtail the problem of researchers storing more data than was allowed. And I said, well, is this working? And he said, no. And I said, he said the researchers preferred to pay these fines than to deal with the data. Like, they were like, oh, fine, just charge me another $500. Like, I'll just put it on the grant, you know? <laughs> so, and he's like, I don't know what to do, because he said, I'm starting to charge such ridiculous prices. Like, this is, just doesn't seem right. So, um, so anyway, I thought, well, there's some problems here, right? It's like, uh, there's too much data for anyone to store, really, because, you know, hence the limitations in the lab. But also, there's the added problem that there's too much data for anyone to reasonably deal with in the course of a day. Like, it, you know, this researcher is like spending time over and over, you know, trying to go through her data. And uh, so the end result of this will be that eventually no one will be able to use this data efficiently, even the researcher who created it, um, because there'll be too much of it and it won't have been curated in any way. So I thought, well, how could librarians help with this, right? In a way that does not involve librarians adopting all sorts of like space age skills, you know, that maybe don't, haven't even been invented yet. So I was like, what, how can libraries do what they do in this environment to solve this problem, right? So, and I thought, well, I mean, one of the things that's going on is that, I mean, this data is just sort of being dumped, right? And so, but this data, I mean, at least in genomics, I mean, it comes out of these, these next generation sequencing machines, like the Illumina, right? The data comes out with a whole bunch of metadata, right? And that metadata can be used to decide what is done with that data. So you can say, like, sort of, if data is X, then do Y with it, you know, and that sort of thing. If data comes out on this date, do this with it. So that metadata actually provides you with uh, an opportunity to, uh, to systematically deal with the data without having to be a sort of a human, you know, deleting and moving and that sort of thing. So. So I thought, well, you know, uh, a librarian could, you know, come in, right, and work with a researcher to develop rules for managing the data in a systematic way. So, like, talking to the researcher, saying, so what if your data can be deleted and when? So if it's older than this many years, can it just be bumped? Like, or if it's from, if you get, a, like, a new, you know, iteration of the aluminum machine, you know, the old stuff actually isn't as valuable once you get the, the new kind of machine. So, you know, can that stuff be dumped? And, and all these different rules of like if it's you know associated with a particular project, right? You might have three projects going on at once. If it's associated with a particular project, can it be sort of put in this on this server or in this directory and that sort of thing? Um, also, if you get new data, right, from a, a sequence you're running, can that override the previous data that is similar, right? So all these different rules, and you know it's and also with an eye on preservation, sort of what needs to be preserved, and also with an eye on what needs to be shared later because of funding requirements. And those are things that librarians know about and researchers may know about but not really have a sort of maybe, uh, may not think about it in a way that's sort of as easy to apply rules to, if that makes sense, because we do this all the time, you know, in libraries, we sort of take things and divide them up and organize them, so that's what we're good at. And uh, so anyway, I sort of had this vision that a librarian could go in, work with a researcher to figure out the rules based on preservation and all these sorts of things. And then, I mean, actually implementing these rules is actually pretty trivial. I mean, it's sort of light scripting. I mean, Python's the language that's popular in bioinformatics, but it's just a matter of sort of a lot of statements that say, if metadata equals, if metadata x equals y, then do this with it. You know, and these are sort of rules, right? And, and then pretty soon you have a, you know, the problem may not be solved, but the problem may be mitigated, right? Using librarian skills in this environment. 
So that's just uh, an example. So librarians know about preservation, metadata, classification, publishing requirements with respect to data, and they know about repositories for storing data. So, I mean, a librarian can do all sorts of things like, like I remember I was working with uh, the SRA, which is the NCBI, which was supposed to go completely, I don't know how many people know, but it was supposed to be completely dismantled by NLM and then they decided to, uh, to keep it, but, or by NCBI and they decided to keep it, but it's a, it's a repository for a short read, it's a short read archive for uh, some genomic data and uh, they require that their data be uh, submitted in a particular format with particular metadata fields, right? So a librarian could very well help, you know, with these rules sort of set the data up in a way that it's like ready to go to the SRA, you know, right off the bat, which would save the researcher a lot of time and, and all that. So anyway, all of this knowledge of the preservation of metadata, et cetera, will help researchers write rules that make sense for the researchers and the data. So that was just one example. So this is sort of hypothetical, a real problem with a hypothetical solution that maybe we will actually get to implement <laughs> at MIT, I hope. And, uh, but uh, so anyway, this is sort of the kind of thing I learned, I think, from the eScience Institute that it's important to understand what the questions are because Without the right questions, we won't get the right answers, kind of thing. And uh, anyway, there's I have other examples, but I won't. Uh, but I think you can probably think of examples at your institution too. These sort of small problems that can be solved. So, uh, so I'll just leave you with this: that uh, computers are useless; they can only give you answers. And uh, so, the, the the point here being, you know, that it's actually the question that matters. And if we're not asking the right questions, then we'll never find, you know, the right answer, kind of thing. So, so does any? I don't know. Do I take questions, or does that come later? <laughs> All right, so thank you. That's it. <laughs>